Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to let Scott begin this morning. Uh, as well. Um, hi, everyone. This is uh, Scott Warren, co-founder of Generation Citizen. Uh, we'll be recording this to, to send out to folks. Um, so excited to, to talk uh, about social media on this call uh, and questions folks have on fundraising and, and getting investors. Um, we've been excited to, to get the, the, the network uh, going. You can always access resources on the network. Uh, Merrill, who has been uh, our primary um, go-to to date, uh, is, is not with us this summer. Um, so we have a group of folks, including um, Bonnie Mills and Cindy Menzen, who are helping out with the network for now, and, and Chelsea Schuster, who's on this call, uh, and excited to, to send around MOUs as well. Um, so we're hopeful to um, continue to, to build up the network um, and continue to, to hopefully serve as a resource to you all uh, as we figure out um, next best steps uh, for the for the for the network as well. Um, so so thanks to to watching this webinar and hope will provide some helpful tips on on social media. Great, thanks, Scott. Um, for those of you um, joining the network and listening today, um, please feel free to um, contact us at the, um, at the website listed here below. Um, also, feel free to visit the website and um, take advantage of any of the resources that are there, um, including other uh, webinars that we've done in the past. In fact, we've done two previous webinars. The first was just covering the basics of the network with a brief introduction to Generation Citizen and other partners that are also within the network. Um, the second re webinar delved into methods for training volunteers. One of Generation Citizen's program staff shared some of our strategies, and we also heard from other members of the network regarding the unique situations they face and how they meet those when working with volunteers. Both of these webinars can be found on the Global Network website, along with related shared materials um, for each of the webinars. This is our third webinar, and we'll be taking a look at strategies for fundraising and networking. First, we'll be hearing from Chelsea Schuster, Generation Citizens Communications Associate, who will be discussing strategies, planning, and tracking of fundraising. Next, Sydney Menzen, a Fulbright Scholar and Summer Intern with Generation Citizen, will be introducing a number of grant and funding opportunities available to you and your organizations. Finally, we will wrap up with discussion and questions. We encourage you to share your own methods and experiences during this time, as always. Uh, we hope to learn from your valuable expertise as well. We're going to let Chelsea go ahead and get started. Great. Thanks so much, Bonnie. I'm really excited today to share with you some really high level uh, approaches and tactics and strategies for how we approach fundraising and development here at Generation Citizen. So, we're going to go ahead and cover a really um, quick overview of the development landscape here at the organization, touch on planning, revenue streams, prospecting and cultivation, and then finish off with data management. So really our goal here and our focus here today is for us again to give you this high level overview of how we approach fundraising here at Generation Citizen and hope that you find some valuable takeaways applicable for your organization. So to get us started, Generation Citizen was officially incorporated as a 501c3 tax-deductible charitable organization in 2010, which is great to incentivize gifts here in the United States. We have an operating budget of $2.6 million in the fiscal year 2017. Our fiscal year operates from July 1 through June 30th. We have six program regions, as some of you are probably familiar. We have 29 staff members, two full-time development staff on our national team. So here at Generation Citizen, each program site has a goal of raising 100% of their budget or to be on track to do so. And the national development staff really supports each site in getting to that goal of raising 100% of their budget. In addition, we have three uh, board structures here at GC. We have a national gover governing board with 14 members in total. And the National Board's uh, role is really to oversee and help implement our organizational plan, provide financial oversight, and obviously play a critical role in fundraising for the organization. They both contribute personally and they help us identify new prospects and donors. 
The regional local advisory boards, uh, there's one in every single one of Generation Citizens program sites, as well as associate boards, their role is to predominantly raise the visibility and build awareness uh, for the organization and action civics at large. And they really play a critical role in le leveraging their personal and professional network. And they also contribute uh, personally uh, and financially to the organization and help us identify new prospects. Great. So every good fundraising uh, approach starts with a good fundraising plan. So I did want to touch on this for just a few minutes, uh, particularly, I think, for organizations that are just getting started and are relatively young. I think it's so critical that you really invest the time to creating a strong fundraising plan. So every fiscal year, um, Generation Citizen starts planning for the next fiscal year in spring. So this is a process that uh, we just recently wrapped up. And each region has their own fundraising plan here at Generation Citizen, which is rooted in achieving the financial goals for their sites, but also to really amplify the overall strategic plan at large for Generation Citizen. And then ultimately the regional plans then feed into an organization-wide plan uh, that really shapes the direction of our fundraising initiatives. So, for us, uh, I believe personally and professionally that every good fundraising plan must include reflection. So looking back on what are your successes and challenges to date, analysis, uh, what did you raise last year? What sources of funding supported your organization predominantly? And really, what do your supporters look like? So really understanding that profile of your supporters. And then obviously sub, uh, establishing your financial goals. So how much does it cost to run your program? How much do you need for cash flow, for capital growth? Uh, really setting your goals to be realistic and rooted in costs. And then you really wanna outline the activities to help you reach those goals. So are you going to be having events? Uh, what are your cultivation and engagement touch points for your donors and foundations? Um, are you going to be doing grant writing? and prospect research, board stewardship, etc. And since we're all interested uh, and are dedicated to civics, I felt that it's uh, important to quote Ben Franklin in this moment, <laughs> if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. <laughs> Great. So currently we have five major revenue streams here at Generation Citizen, foundations, individuals, corporations, fee-for-service, and government. Foundations are Generation Citizens' historically most significant source of revenue. Individuals are our second most significant source of revenue. And then corporations, historically at the organization, um, have really served the purpose of providing sponsorships, uh, sponsorships for Generation Citizen events, such as Civics Day and our Civic Tech Challenge. The fee-for-service is actually a fee that schools or districts pay to um, have access to our curriculum, and uh, not all schools or districts pay for this, but it is an option for those that can afford to do so. And government, which is our newest source of revenue. Um, essentially, we are seeing interest from some of the local governments in the sites that we are working in um, who are prioritizing civics education, which is a really exciting thing to see happening. So currently here in New York City, and just most recently in Rhode Island, uh, we are seeing city governments invest in our work through the city budget. Great, and I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of the percentage of revenue that we get from each revenue stream. So as you can see, um, as I stated before, Foundations and individuals um, are our biggest source of revenue, so we really want to root our strategies in data as we look to our planning. Um, again, here we uh, can see a quick snapshot of revenue growth from 2013 to 2018. We have seen steady and consistent growth year over year. And I wanted to highlight this again for some of the organizations who are just getting started. Um, Really, I want to note that a strong fundraising plan, prioritizing healthy budgets and attainable goals and time for prospecting and cultivation, you really are setting yourself up for success and really seeing, hopefully, the uh, revenue growth for your organization. Great. And here, uh, we see growth by revenue source. 
So to note, you can see not only our growth over year, but that we have also prioritized diversifying our revenue streams through corporate and government gifts, um, seeing an increase in those over the years. As we look ahead, uh, we will prioritize in fiscal year 2018, uh, major investment from foundations and then major donors, consistent with historically our strongest re revenue streams. Great, so prospecting and cultivation is the next thing I wanna discuss because they're such cornerstones of every good fundraising plan. And just to uh, reiterate, prospecting is the activity of finding new funding sources and cultivation is the activity of moving prospects to financially contribute to your cause. And a great starting point um, for identifying new funds is research. So for individuals, really you wanna start thinking about who, consider affinity, capacity, and access. So affinity, who's motivated by your cause, capacity, who has the financial resources to give, and access, how close is this person to your network? So foundations, uh, here I've noted a few, a few uh, places where you can find new prospects as well as find um, new prospects for foundations and corporations as well. We see some overlap in terms of annual reports and other supporter lists for organizations that are similar to yours. Um, but I do wanna note when it comes to foundations and corporations, you really have a great opportunity to establish a relationship with them. Um, so really prioritize when you find a foundation or corporation that seems like they're really aligned in your cause. Take that initiative and go ahead and reach out and set up a meeting and share information about your organization and then actively stay engaged with them. So in summary on this slide, I'd just like to note why is prospect research so important? Uh, it's so important because it informs our asks, financial and otherwise, so it allows us to categorize our donors and prospects and tailor messaging and frequency of communication to them. And ultimately, it helps us build deeper relationships with our donors and supporters. So I added this slide, uh, which is a snapshot of how we communicate uh, to our board, the approach for them to help us identify and pull in major donors to our work. and really. I wanted to note that um, it supports the concept that we must consider affinity, capacity, and access. So opening your network, exploring it, who's connected to GC, what motivates them to be connected to action civics education, and then ultimately um, closing on great prospects. So again, who has that capacity to give and uh, has a record of a giving history. So just again, thinking about alignment and uh, pulling people into your work. Great. So when it comes to cultivation, we do have an interesting process here at Generation Citizen called Moves Management. Moves Management helps us prioritize donor prospects and identify and deploy engagement opportunities that ultimately bring our prospects closer to us and then sustain their interest in the long term. So we look at the donor prospect life, si life cycle, excuse me, um, in five steps. Identifying those prospects, qualifying them, so again, identifying what aligns them to our mission. Cultivating them, what are those tactics for engagement? Pulling them in closer, and then ultimately soliciting, making the ask, and then stewarding them. So really supporting their investment in the organi organization over the long term. Sometimes prospecting and cultivation can feel overwhelming because you do have pot potentially a lot of opportunity to have a big list of people you might want to cultivate to get to your organization. So we use a prospect priority approach to help us figure out who our top targets are um, and what are our engagement tactics for, for cultivating them. So to help narrow, prioritize, and identify our primary prospects, uh, we use an engagement ranking system that you see here. Our prospect priority system helps to inform how many touch points prospects need to move them closer to us and ready them for an ask. So for an example, you'll see that the top 40 prospects have shown some interest in our work, but are not ready to be fully engaged. However, top 10 prospects are frequently in contact with us and we are frequently in contact with them. 
and they are ready for us to solicit. And I just wanted to also quickly touch on engagement opportunities for prospects. So here you can see opportunities to engage with our mission um, through small board hosted events um, across all of our boards um, by plugging them also into our program. So inviting them to speak in a classroom, um, inviting them to a um, democracy coach meeting. Um, so take a look at this uh, when you get some time for some inspiration around how you can pull prospects closer into your organization. And the final cornerstone of successful fundraising is data management. Here we use a CRM called Salesforce, which is a one-stop shop for effective fundraising and revenue projection, um, as well as maintaining all of the important notes on our, on our donors. Um, and also this is how we systematize our prospect research, as well as prioritize those who we are going to identify as top targets for investment at Generation Citizen. So Salesforce really helps us, again, um, be, uh, roll out effective fundraising. Um, it also helps us track revenue, both projected and income, incoming revenue that's, that we have already received. And it also helps us manage all of our volunteer opportunities uh, and our stakeholder management as well. And also, it's really an important tool for helping us collect analysis on our donors. So Really, it informs the profiling of our uh, donors. So in all, that is what I have to share with you today. I hope that you enjoyed this high-level overview of Generation Citizens fundraising approach, and I'm gonna turn it over to Sydney. Great, thank you so much, Chelsea, for that great overview. Really interesting to learn more about Generation Citizens funding strategies. So next, uh, during this webinar, I'll be covering some grant opportunities that might be of interest to you all uh, that fund initiatives related to civic education, promoting democracy, human rights, amongst other themes. So first, um, we have some grant opportunities that you can currently find on the Global Network website. So I'll start with the United Nations Democracy Fund, which was created back in 2005 when it was um, adopted by a resolution, uh, adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations, ultimately with the goal to further the mission of the UN to promote fundamental values such as freedom, equality, solidarity, tolerance, respect for all human rights, and to promote education for peace and human development. So the United Nations Democracy Fund uh, supports projects that are two years long, and applicants can request a minimum of 100,000 US dollars and a maximum of 300,000 US dollars. And these projects typically aim to strengthen the voice of civil society, promote human rights, uh, and other aspects of democratic societies. Um, and so this application process that happens in the fall of 2017, and I'll be sending around more information about application deadlines and such following this webinar um, so more details to come. Next, we have the Ford Foundation, which has actually been around for about 80 years now and is guided by a vision of social justice. It funds projects primarily to reduce poverty and injustice, to strengthen de democratic values, and to promote international cooperation and advance human achievement. The Ford Foundation invests in projects that are led by individuals strong institutions and innovative and uh, creative organizations. Ultimately, these projects that are funded by the Ford Foundation promote greater democratic governance um, and societies that are more fair and inclusive and ultimately try to create opportunities for all people to be involved in their societies. Again, more information about deadlines and such to come. So next, we have some grant opportunities that come from the Open Society Foundation, which was first started back in 1979 to promote open and tolerant societies and to combat communism. So here I'll be talking about some opportunities for Latin American countries as well as in those in Eastern Africa. Um, but overall, the Open Society Foundation focuses 
on areas such as education, free press, public health, women's rights, and much more. Uh, the foundation supports democratically elected governments and a civil society that helps keep government power in check. It hopes to shape public policies to ensure greater fairness in political, legal, and economic systems and to safeguard fundamental rights. So for Latin American initiatives, the Open Society Foundation uh, funds projects in four key areas, which include accountability and transparency of government, citizen security, human rights, and policy debate and dialogue. So next we have great opportunities um, for East African countries. Uh, and ultimately the initiatives that this program is looking to fund uh, focuses on projects oriented towards democratic governance and rule of law, um, economic governance, enhancing health and human rights, as well as promoting equality and non-discrimination against all citizens. And lastly, we have the Mott Foundation, um, which primarily funds domestic organizations here in the US, but does in fact uh, support initiatives uh, in South Africa. And it focuses, uh, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, on projects oriented towards the community advice office sector, as well as philanthropy development. And what those two focus on is that um, <clears throat> for the community advice office sector, uh, it seeks to foster strong and sustainable community advice offices and related community-based organizations that assist poor and marginalized communities. And so in this program, the Mott Foundation makes grants to intermediary organizations that um, provide free and accessible legal advice and related services to poor and marginalized people and foster local community development and programs such as those. Um, and then for the philanthropy development, it really promotes local philanthropy, local giving um, to, again, foster community development. So if your programs are in South Africa and related to these themes, definitely look into the Mott Foundation. Um, and those are a couple of new great opportunities that you can look into. Again, I'll be sending some information about that following the webinar, so stay tuned for more details. Great, thanks, Sydney. And we'll provide um, the um, this webinar, as we said before, is being taped. So we'll also put this um, on the website and we'll send it around afterwards as well. Um, we did want to open it up for a little bit of Q&A. Um, we've got some questions that were sent in um, prior to the webinar, um, but wanted to open the floor to anybody who currently um, has any questions. So. Any new question that is? Okay, well, let's go ahead then and look at some of the questions that were already sent in. And then um, we can always check back in to see if anyone has any questions as we go along. Um, I'm gonna turn it over um, to Chelsea and Sydney to answer some of these questions. Um, so Chelsea, feel free to start with any of the questions here that you'd like to address. Sure, so why don't I go ahead and just start with this very first question. What do I need to have ready before I start talking to investors? I think this is a really, really great question because what you need to have ready is an articulate case for why people should support your cause. So really on a, on a um, level of just uh, very tactical, I think having some talking points about um, having some talking points, a one pager, some data points that really speak to what you're accomplishing through your program or through your organization are critical. Um, also, it's really important to understand your audience. So when you're thinking about going into a meeting with a potential prospect, know who you're speaking to. What if, if you can find any research uh, looking at their bio, looking online, looking at um, maybe what they studied in school, understand uh, potentially, if you can, what motivates them to invest and speak to that, um, those that would be my recommendation. Great, thanks, Chelsea. No problem. Um, 
let's open up the floor again and see if there's anybody that has a question at this point. Okay, we'll address, um, how about we go through and address two more, Chelsea? Great. Um, and also, I'd love for our CEO, Scott Warren, to jump in if he would like to answer any of these questions, particularly from the perspective of someone who um, is the founder of an organization. Um, so I like this question of how do I establish a sustainable relationship with a donor when just starting out? Scott, maybe you want to take that one. Yeah, I think, um, you know, part of it is when you're just starting an organization, um, as, as I'm sure many folks in the network have, um, it's important to sell people on the idea of the organization and the passion that, that you have. Um, and so there might be, I think there are certain donors that are more interested in organizations that are a little older and have been around for a while. Uh, and then there are certain donors that are more interested in, um, you know, really helping with uh, at the onset with an idea. So I think um, you know, part of it is just, um, you know, finding folks that are, that are more interested in that initial stage and then also, um, you know, keeping, uh, keeping track of, um, of, of what's going on. And so, uh, you know, really um, uh, talking to them every month, every few months, telling them what's going on, keeping them in the loop uh, and, and telling them how they've been part of your success, too. So I think making them feel like they're part of the, um, the journey is really important as well. Great, thanks so much, Scott. Um, maybe you could also weigh in, if you don't mind, on this question of what do I do if I just keep getting rejected? I think rejection is uh, almost guaranteed at some point, right, in the fundraising life cycle. Um, but yeah, can you talk to your experience uh, in relation to this question? Yeah, and I mean, that, that happens a lot at the beginning and it happens, uh, you know, it, it happens a lot. Um, uh, you know, it still happens. And I think part of it is just, I think some of the stats are if you have a relationship with a donor, um, you know, uh, or, or it's not a cold entry, you'll get funding half the time. If you don't, it's more like 20 to 30%. So um, that means that there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of rejection along the way. And I think part of it is just, um, you know, uh, in fundraising, a lot of times when people say no at the beginning, um, you can still keep in touch with them and they, and they might be able to, to donate down the line, that's happened to us a lot. Um, and I think sometimes it's just, you know, having enough faith and power in your idea that, um, you know, you keep at it. Um, so it's definitely gonna happen. There's no one that's, um, that's, that's done this, uh, you know, without, um, you know, getting, um, you know, getting, getting a decent amount of rejection. Uh, and so you just gotta weather the storm and believe in, uh, believe in, believe in the idea. Great, thanks so much. Um, do, you, do we want to um, open the floor up one more time for anybody um, to ask any other questions? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you all for participating today and for joining us on the webinar. Thank you for sending some thought-provoking questions. Um, as we said before, we're going to share this webinar um, via um, email after the call as well as on the network's website. Um, and we'll send along also a bit more detail about the grant opportunities that Sydney shared too. Um, finally, just as some basic housekeeping things, keep in mind that we'll be sending out some details about the MOU for all network partners. If you are new to the network or not yet a member, um, please uh, take a look at our website. Feel free to email us if you'd like more information and you're interested. If you're already currently a member, keep your eye out for the MOU, which is just gonna make some more formal requests about participating in things like webinars, helping to lead them, um, contributing to the website with resources and blog posts and things like that, so we can continue to just create a really robust space for us to all learn from each other. Um, we hope all of you guys have a great rest of the day, and uh, we do hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everybody.